Welcome and thank you for joining us for the online encounter. Whether you're joining us from Omaha or anywhere in any part of the world, we want you to know that you're part of the Love Church family and we're glad that you're here. Make sure that you subscribe and turn on notifications for our channel so that you never miss a message from Love Church. Now grab your Bibles and let's get started. Well, did you guys show up to get in the Word today? Come on, Numbers chapter 22. Numbers 22, that's where we'll be today. I'm gonna pray and then we'll launch into this study. Jesus, we just acknowledge that you're here, that you're present, you've been ministering to us. God, we thank you for your presence. We ask God that you would just continue to speak to us. We lean in, we, we come here. God, I pray all distractions, you, you would cause us to be in this moment to receive what you have for us. God, I just be believe that you wanna speak a fresh word. You wanna pour out your spirit on the dry bones in this place. For the depressed, the despondent, those that feel dry. God, I just pray that you would revive us today. Just have your way, in Jesus' name. Amen, amen, amen. I wanna ask you a question, have you ever found yourself moving in a direction or ending up in a place that you never intended to go. You ever been there? I've been there many a times. And uh, I'll tell you this one time, I'll take you back a few years. I'm a dad of three. And uh, my oldest boy loves football. And so he loves the Cyclones. Hello. I thought I'd get a few boos in the, in, in the state of Nebraska for that. Well, I guess we're not in the, in the Big Ten, so it's all good. Now, if I said Iowa Hawkeyes, hello, yeah. Okay. Yes, we're on the same page. We agree with that one. Let's go. So anyways, uh, he wanted to go to his first college football game, and he was a young little guy. But, but anybody who knows my oldest son knows that he acts much older than he is. So I'm like, I'll give this a shot. Let's just take this three or four year old to an all day event, 65,000 people. How's he gonna respond? Oh, and he's kind of in the midst of like potty training. So that'll be a good experience. So we go have this incredible day together. So much fun, we're high-fiving each other. We're making videos, we're screaming at the top of our lungs. Iowa State wins, great day. Uh, we start to head back towards Omaha and we get about an hour outside of Des Moines, Iowa. So just for any of you that aren't familiar with the state of Iowa or just geography in general, Des Moines is about two hours to the east of here. And then Ames is another maybe 45 minutes to the north of Des Moines. So are you with me? Are you with me in the car? The Volkswagen, we're driving. It's late at night, it's dark. And I think I just had another cup of coffee. Ju Judah's in the back. And um, next thing you know, um, my little guy has an accident in the car. So we gotta pull off to a gas station and I'll spare you all those details, but you know, yeah. Anyways, some cleanup action. And next thing you know, um, we get back in the car and my emotions are going crazy. Like I'm, I'm somewhat frustrated, but I'm also like, man, dude, like he's just learning, like have some grace. And man, and then I'm starting to beat myself up, like condemning myself because of the thoughts that I'm having and about the frustrations and all this sort of stuff. And I'm driving down the road and it's late at night and I'm tired and he's passed out in the back, right? And so I'm a lone ranger. And next thing you know, I see the sign for Des Moines, Iowa. I'm thinking, what? I should see Council Bluffs, Iowa. Des Moines, Iowa? I, I mean, I literally thought I was hallucinating. How in the world am I back in Des Moines? I was just an hour west of Des Moines. How did I go back to the east another hour? Come on, somebody. I was in a place that I did not intend to be at 11 o'clock at night, by the way. So here I am back in Des Moines, and what do I gotta do? I gotta turn around and drive another two hours back to Omaha, Nebraska. I wasn't where I was supposed to be. And I just think about so often in life, 
You know, Jesus talks about how this, this life that you and I are living is like a pathway. And the Bible says that there's two paths. There's the narrow way and then there's the wide way or the way of the world. And Jesus has invited you and I to walk on this narrow path. And how many of you know that so much of this life of walking down the narrow path is all about being connected to Jesus, being intimate, finding our affection and our fulfillment in him, abiding in the vine like John 15 says, being devoted to him, finding our security in him. How many of you know that when we're connected to Jesus, the result is we end up walking in discernment? Discernment is like getting wisdom from the Holy Spirit on the direction that you and I are to walk in. But so often when we get disconnected from Jesus, we have a lack of discernment which then takes us down pathways that we never intended to go. So in other words, what I'm really trying to say to you this morning is that our devotion determines our desires, our desires determine our direction, and our direction determines our destination. If you ain't taking notes, I'll say it again so you can write it down, because this is my one point. Your devotion determines your desires. Your desires determine your direction, and your direction determines your destination. And so I wanna say this as gracious as I can. If you find yourself in a destination or moving towards a destination that you didn't intend to go or that you never thought you would walk in, could it be connected to misplaced devotion? Could it be that you're devoted to maybe the wrong thing? Because you and I are devoted people. As a matter of fact, I'll prove it to you. Just answer this question. I find my security in blank, in blank. The thing that you find your security in is what you're devoted to. And I'm here to tell you today that, I mean, you, some of you might be thinking right away, Job, job, and yes, a job can provide you financial security. Or maybe you filled that gap in with a relationship. Maybe it was your boyfriend, your girlfriend, your fiance, maybe it was your husband or your wife, maybe it was a friend. And certainly you can find emotional security in relationships. Or may, may, maybe what came to your mind was community or a group of people. And let me just tell you, you can find some security in community, but here's what you can't find in anything else other than Jesus, it's called soul security. Deep security in the deep place of your heart. You are hardwired for relationship with Jesus, the only one that would fulfill and satisfy. And so many of us are like the woman at the well, drinking from all the different wells that this world has to offer, only to come back chasing for more and more and more and more of that thing. Is anybody with me in this place? But Jesus offers something at that well to that woman, and he says this, if you drink from my well, you will never run dry. How many of you know that there's just, there's just this deep-seated peace and purpose that is found only in Christ Jesus? And so what is my mission this morning through Numbers chapter 22? It's to call us all back to this place of intimacy with Jesus. I'm asking us all to evaluate our devotion to him in this season. Because if I'm honest, and if I'm humble, and if I'm transparent with the rest of you, so often, even in my position of pastor and leader in the church, I can start to drift away from the presence of God, from the very essence of what he created me for. And guess what? I settle for close and I, and I, and I push away being connected. And I think so many of us are in that place. We're close to Jesus. We're close to his presence. We're close to the things of God. But we're not connected to the source. How many of you know there's a big difference 
between being close and being connected. So I wanna ask you today, are you close or are you connected? If you find yourself in a place like I did when I was in Des Moines, Iowa, how did I get here? Why did I get here? Why in the world didn't I notice this before I actually landed back here? If you find your place in a place, in a place that you don't wanna be, there's hope for you today. There's a second chance, there's a second touch. Jesus wants to meet you today. I think we have a lot to learn from the character that we're gonna look at today in Numbers chapter 22. His name is Balaam. He's a Gentile. He's from Mesopotamia. And the reality is, is it's interesting because I've been studying him all week long. And isn't it interesting that three chapters in the book of Numbers are devoted to this character named Balaam? And what's interesting is at surface level, when you read through the text, uh, you can start to ask questions like, is this dude on God's team or is he on the enemy's team? Like, I can't quite figure this out. Is he a good guy? Is he a bad guy? And I, so I wanna unpack some of that for you. And it's interesting, all throughout scripture, you know, we can read about what the Bible has to say about this guy. And, um, and so in Numbers chapter 22, uh, it's interesting because a little bit of context here of where, of where we're at in scripture and why I wanna cover this today. So you've got God's chosen people, the Israelites, right? Um, they, they were a chosen people to show to the surrounding nations that there is this one true God, Yahweh. Now this, this people go all the way back to Genesis chapter 12 when Abram received the promise from God. And so God raises up this nation. Well, they end up in slavery in Egypt for over 400 years. Pastor has been talking about this the last few weeks. So what does God do? He raises up a man named Moses. And Moses leads the Israelites out of captivity and bondage in uh, Egypt. And he's leading them towards what? The promised land. The promise all, all along that goes all the way back to Genesis chapter 12. Well, many of you know the story because we've been talking about it the last few weeks. The Israelites send out 12 spies to the land, to the promised land, and they come back and 10 of them have a bad report and two of them have a good report. Well, the 10 that had the bad report spread enough fear amongst the people that they failed to hold on or grab onto the promise that God had for them. And so what did, what, what did God do? He caused them to what? Wander in the wilderness for how many years? 40, 40 years. And so we're picking this up as the people of God, the Israelites, God's chosen people, are wandering in the wilderness. Scholars would say that where we're picking it up in Scripture today, they're about 38 years into that wandering. So they're coming towards the tail end of their time in the wilderness, getting ready to, number one, transition leaders from Moses to Joshua, and number two, get ready to actually receive the promise that God has for them. And so they come up on the the plains of Moab, that's where they're at. And there's a, there's a Moabite king by the name of King Balak. Now, when he sees this vast amount of Israelites come into this valley, he starts to get afraid. They've already conquered some, some other enemies, and so he's like, man, I don't know what to do here. I'm gonna call on this guy named Balaam, and I wanna tell you a little bit about Balaam. So Balaam... He was into all sorts of sorcery and divination, and he basically would put blessings on people, and he would also put curses on people. And, and so King Balak is like, I need to have this guy come to, to, Mo, to Moab, and I need him to put a curse on God's people. So that's the scheme that's going on here, right? That's, that's what's going on big picture. Now, the interesting thing about this is, as you read this text, I will say this, Balaam is one of the most complex characters in all the Bible. Because on one hand, he's a hireling. He's a false prophet. He has selfish motives. I would even go as far to say as evil motives. 
Yet, simultaneously, God speaks to him. God speaks prophetically through him. And it leaves you in this place of being perplexed. So we're gonna dive into this guy a little bit more because what I want us to really, the question I really want us to ask as we're looking at this man's life and where he ends up, which is ultimately in the grave, is I wanna ask why and how. What was the driving force in his life? I think you're gonna see it. I'm gonna story tell it. And so uh, the King, King Balak raises up some, some messengers, and these were prominent people in Moab. Are you guys tracking with me right now? Okay. So he, he takes these prominent people, and he says, I'm gonna send you to Balaam, and I want you to make an offer to him. And so these messengers show up, and they basically lay out the offer. Hey, King Balak wants you to come and curse these people, and he's gonna pay you for it. And so the interesting thing was is, um, it was common for, for Balaam in his practices to go to gods. And so God's in, God, in, the God, Yahweh, ends up speaking to him in this instance. He goes to him and asks if he should go. And listen to what God says. I want you to see this. Because I don't know about you, but this is pretty clear to me. Verse uh, 12 of chapter 22 it says this, but God told Balaam this. This is what God said to him. Do not go with them. You are not to curse these people, for they have been blessed. They have been blessed. And so this is, this is how God feels about this. And so these messengers go back and report to King Balak that he's not gonna come. So what does King Balak do? Do he says no way? I'm gonna, I am going to send a more prominent messengers to him, and some scholars even suggest that maybe he offered a little bit more money. And so they go back to Balaam, and what's interesting here is we we really see his heart in going back to God to see if God will change his mind. It's like what's going on under the surface? God was already super clear. He said not to go, and he gave you the reason why. And yet Balaam comes back to him, and so what's interesting is we read this text, and God ends up allowing him to go. And so when you read this, you can be a little perplexed, but here's, here's, here's what I want us to gather from this, is God is not gonna headlock you and I into obedience. He's given us free will, and so so that's why we've really gotta ask God to search our hearts because the deep motivations deep in our soul are like the driving force that's moving this engine forward. Our devotion, the things we're devoted to, they end up influencing the strong desires that are in our heart that end up moving us in a direction. And in this case, when you start to learn more about Balaam and what other areas of scripture say about him, he was driven by this greed that was deep down inside of him. And how many of you know that we can't serve both God and mammon, the Bible says, right? And so I think we need to ask God to search our hearts this morning. What is the deep motivation that's driving us in a direction that maybe we don't wanna go? I felt like God wanted me to tell you this morning to get off the fence it's time to get off the fence because the enemy owns the fence. You can't have both feet in both camps. It's time to consecrate ourselves to the one true God, to, to, to re-engage in our connection with him. Because how many of you know that he wants to do exceedingly abundantly above all we could ask, think, or imagine? And it doesn't mean that it's always gonna be peaches and cream. We will walk through trials, we will walk through tribulation, but how many of you know that he is with us, he'll never leave us nor forsake us, and he gives us the strength to keep moving and persevere through it? Our worst days with God are much better than our best days without him. I'd much rather walk through the valley of the shadow of death with Jesus on my side than experience a little bit of success without him for a while. He's calling us back to this place 
of deep devotion. Connection. What's funny is God has a sense of humor. And another reason why I think he allowed him to go is for our sake. Because there's another truth that's being revealed throughout this scripture, is that no weapon formed against God's plan will prosper. God is protecting his people. The enemy wanted to move demonically through this, through this man to curse his people, and God said, no way, not on my watch. And we need to know that today. We need to know that if we are in Christ Jesus, we are protected by our God. He goes before us. He fights our battles on our behalf. That's just a side note this morning. Can we give him some praise for that? Come on. So Balaam, verse 21, gets up, saddles up on this donkey, and starts off with the Moabite officials moving towards Moab. Verse 22, we see God's heart clearly right here. But God was angry that Balaam was going. So he sent the angel of the Lord to stand in the road to block his way. As Balaam and two servants were riding along, Balaam's donkey saw the angel of the Lord standing in the road with a drawn sword in his hand. The donkey bolted off the road into a field. But check this out. But Balaam beat it and turned it back onto the road. I don't know about you, but when I read the Bible, I like try to visualize certain things. And so just picture yourself driving down I-80. And every once in a while, you see a car off on the shoulder. Every once in a while, you see some cows meandering in the pasture. But never once do you look over and see a man just beating a donkey in the field. I mean, what would you be thinking if you saw this? I mean, this is crazy. Balaam is so upset, but isn't it funny that the donkey is more discerning in this moment than this deceived man? That's what misplaced devotion does to us, by the way. As a matter of fact, I'll go as far to say this. And I say this with all due respect and humility in my heart because I was just here about a month ago. Oftentimes, when we're deceived and when we're broken, and we're operating out of this place, we're not even aware of it unless the Holy Spirit lets us, makes us aware of it. So there's a lot of people sitting in, that's why right now, listen, Holy Spirit, reveal to us where we have misplaced devotion. Search our hearts in this moment. Reveal our brokenness to us. Re reveal the deep places, the rocky places in our heart that we are still operating out of. In Jesus' name, amen. I can't reveal it to you, he can though. And oftentimes the most broken people don't even know they're broken because they're so deceived. And that's what's happening here. Balaam is moving down the road, the, the donkey actually sees the angel of the Lord, Balaam has no clue and he's just beating the donkey. This happens two more times. And then in verse 28, look what it says, then the Lord gave the donkey the ability to speak. Now this is crazy. Are you picturing this? What have I done to you that deserves your beating me three times, it asked Balaam. Can you picture this? I don't know what's more crazy, the donkey talking or Balaam responding. He said this, you made me look like a fool. If I had a sword of me, I would kill you. Do you think right about now, he's like, I'm actually having a conversation with a donkey right now. but I'm the same donkey that you have ridden all your life, the donkey answered. Ever done anything like this before? No. Then the Lord opened Balaam's eyes and he saw the angel of the Lord standing in the roadway with a drawn sword in his hand. Balaam bowed his head and fell face down on the ground before him. Why did you beat your donkey those three times? The angel of the Lord demanded. And I, and I love this, this next line reveals it. This is, this is where his heart is. Look, I have come to block your way because you are stubbornly resisting me. You, you may not be outright stubbornly resisting Jesus, but what area of your life are you resisting him in? Because he wants to give you freedom. He wants to break those walls down. 
Three times the donkey saw me and shied away. Otherwise, I would have certainly killed you by now and spared the donkey. The donkey saved this man's life. Then Balaam confessed to the angel of the Lord, I have sinned, and here it is. I didn't realize you were standing in the road to block my way. He was blinded in his disobedience. I will return home if you're against me going. The angel lets him end up going, but he says this, look now I have come, but I have no power to say whatever I want. I will speak only the message that God puts in my mouth. That was the command that the angel of the Lord gave Balaam. And so three times, King Balak asked Balaam to curse the Israelites, and three times he ends up blessing God's people with some of the most profound prophetic poetry in all of the Old Testament. It's kind of crazy. But here's where the, the real character is revealed in Balaam, because if you stop the story there, you're gonna think that there was a heart change. But flip over to chapter 31. Look what it says. Moses asked this question to the people in verse 15. Why have you let all the women live? What is he talking about? The Israelites ended up conquering the Moabites and killing a bunch of them. God allowed this as judgment, why? Why were, why were the Moabites being judged? Right here, verse 16. These are the very ones who followed Balaam's advice and caused the people of Israel to rebel against the Lord at Mount Peor. So here's what happened. This demonic attack, this, this cursing, the, God would not allow it to happen. So Balaam gives advice to the Moabite women to go and seduce the Israelite men. So what happens? These women go and seduce the Israelite men. Next thing you know, these Israelite men are sleeping with these Moabite women and they're defiling themselves and they all of a sudden start worshiping false gods like the God of Baal. And God's judgment, because of, because of God's love and his, his command, 24,000 Israelites ended up dying as a result of this man influencing these women to go and seduce. So you see his real character. And you look at the result, look at the result. Go back to 31.8, it says this, all five of the Midianite kings, Evel, Rechem, Zer, Hur, and Reba died in battle. They also killed Balaam, son of Beor, with the sword. So in this case, Balaam's devotion determined his desire, and his desires determined his direction, and his direction determined his destination, and his destination was death. The same principle of devotion and desire and destination is true in our very own lives. Everything begins with devotion. Your devotion is your place of affection the place that you go to find fulfillment and satisfaction. And I love what Jesus said in John chapter 15. And this, this, is, this will hopefully illustrate this, this idea of the difference between being connected and being close. In verse five of 15, he says, yes, I am the vine, you are the branches. Those who remain in me and I in them will produce much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. But in verse 10, it says, when you obey my commands, you remain in my love, just as I obey my Father's commandments and remain in his love. So what's the key? The key is obedience. What's the key to obedience? It's hearing his voice. Britain, where do you hear his voice? It's when you get before him, and it's not about religious routine. We serve a God that will speak to you through his revealed will right there in the word of God. But our God is alive and active. He'll speak through a donkey if he wants to. Because he loves us and he cares for us and he wants to get us on the right path. And he's passionately affectionate about us. His heart is that none would perish. This is his heart for us, church. His heart is to have relationship. And for so many, for so long, so many of us have, have lived in this place of just believing that we, we've just, we've sold out for religion. 
and religious show without genuine devotion always leads to tragedy. Let me say that again. Religious show without genuine devotion always leads to tragedy, and it led to tragedy in this man's life. And the same is true for you and I. And so I just believe in this place as I was praying. God spoke two things to me. He said a second chance and he said a second touch. And this is good that they took my pulpit away because we're gonna see how much is in my mind here. But Luke chapter 13 was the picture that God gave me. Because some of you right now, we're just being honest now. Your devotion, you, you can identify with the greed. You've been pursuing more green and more green, trying to find fulfillment in the, in the money, money, money. Or, or, or maybe it, it's your, your devotion is to your lust and you've been in bondage to pornography. Or, or maybe, maybe your bondage has been to other people. Like you're so consumed with what man thinks about you that you won't step out. Fear of man is what your devotion is to because you'd rather please people than please him. And so I don't know what it is for you in this place today, but I do know this, that devotion to anything other than Jesus leaves you like the fig tree that we, leave, that we read about in Luke chapter 13. Luke chapter 13, Jesus approaches this gardener. And it's interesting because it says this, that a man planted a fig tree in his garden and came again and again to see if there was any fruit on it but he was always disappointed. Isn't that interesting when you know deep down that you're not where God has called you to be? It always creates this dissatisfaction, this disappointment deep down inside of us. Verse seven says this, finally he said to his gardener, I've waited three years and there hasn't been a single fig. Cut it down, it's just taken up space in the garden. And that's how some of us feel today. We're either not producing fruit or we're producing the wrong fruit. But here's what the gardener answered with, sir, here it is, give it one more chance. Give it one more chance. Come on, look to your neighbor and say, give it one more chance. Give it one more chance. Leave it another year and I'll give it special attention and plenty of fertilizer. I believe God wants to aerate some soils and some hearts today, hello. If we get figs next year, fine. If not, then you can cut it down. I believe this morning, maybe you identify with Balaam. And I wanna speak specifically to those of you in the room where you are, you are like, you are engaged in the ministry. I, I wanna speak to our staff right now. By the way, can we give it up for the staff here at Love Church? But how many of you know you can be around the things of Jesus and disconnected from him? You're serving him faithfully, but you're not dining with him. And whether you're a staff member or you're somebody in this place that's been serving a lot in ministry, you've been close to Jesus but not connected to Jesus, that might be the reason why you're experiencing dryness, depression, despondency to his voice in your life. And I believe today he wants to give you a second chance and a second touch like we read in Mark chapter eight. Mark chapter eight, Jesus leads a blind man outside the city. He spits in the ground and wipes mud on his eyes. And then he asks him to open his eyes. And he says, do you see anything? He says, yes, I see the people, but they just look like a bunch of trees. So he could see a little bit more clear, but he couldn't see all the way clear. He didn't have full clarity. So what does Jesus do? He touches his eyes a second time, spits in the ground, puts the mud on his eyes, asks him to open it, and he says, what do you see? And the man says, I see clearly. So the invitation as you stand to your feet today, go ahead and stand to your feet. God wants to minister to us today. 
and it's gonna require you to get out of your seat if you're in the place and you wanna receive from him. So we're gonna, we're gonna create some space here. I told you I was there recently. I was out in Colorado about a month ago and there was this man who, he was sharing this, this message on second touch and, and second chance and he was speaking from the life of David. He was ministering to a bunch of us leaders from all over the country and it's so easy, you know, it's so sad that so many pastors and leaders are getting burnt out and they're tapping out and they're giving up or they're falling away or they're making mistakes. And so this time was set aside to just receive. And Jesus was in this place. And this man shares this message and his name was Ken. He's from the UK. He's an investment banker that's made a difference in the kingdom of God. And the, the running joke with all the guys at this event was don't go sit next to him because he'll just start like, this dude was a prophet and he will just start like, he'll get all up in your business. I'm like, you know what? I'm gonna go sit up next to him on the couch. And so I sit next to him on the couch and he just looks at me and he says, are you a driver? Like, are you, you like to, you're an achiever, right? And I'm like, yeah, yeah. He's like, man, like, are you, are you feeling burdened? He just, question after question after question. I'm just like, next thing you know, he's just taking me down this pathway and this journey, tears coming down my eyes. Next thing you know, he's got me in a moment from my childhood that I remembered where I experienced a lot of brokenness and hurt and rejection and confusion. And he brought me to this moment and he said, Jesus was there. And when you felt rejected, Jesus was choosing you then. And you need to go back to that moment and you didn't know that he was there. You need to experience this healing power in that place or you're gonna keep leading from that place in your heart. And when he said this, it just unlocked, it unlocked something. And I started to experience Jesus the rest of my time there in a fresh way. Later that night, these guys were prophesying and praying over me and it was just this powerful experience. Second touch, second chance. And so I wanna, I wanna make space in this place. We did this in the first encounter, it's powerful. Our leaders are ready to pray for you. But if, if you feel like I'm ministering to you today and you've, you've gotten off on the wrong path or maybe you're in a place that you never thought you would be or maybe you just need a fresh word, a fresh touch, fresh vision from Jesus, I want you to make your way forward I want you to just come now, come now. Just make your way forward. If you need a fresh touch, if you need a fresh touch this morning, just make your way. Come on, it's gonna require humility if you wanna receive from the living God, living water, breathing, alive. Come on, can we get some leaders up here? Let's get some leaders up here to lay hands on these folks. Come on, church, I'm activating you. You can move in this place if you're being stirred in your heart. Holy Spirit, minister. Holy Spirit, fresh vision. Holy Spirit, get into the rocky soil of the, of the hearts of those that are up here. Yes, Lord. Those who sow in tears will reap in joy. I prophesy over, over your life right now. Lord, would you reveal that you're real to this young man, that you have a plan for him in Jesus' name. God, I pray for more creative, fresh vision for Val. God, I pray you'd pour out your spirit. Leaders, begin praying for them. Begin praying, you're activated. Begin praying to them. Let the fire fall. Let the fire fall. We ask Holy Spirit, fall fresh on us. Come on, we say it like this. Holy Spirit, you are welcome. Come fly this place and fill the atmosphere. Your glory, God, is what? To the overcome. Come on, church, come on, just press in right here. Come on, raise your hands and say, Holy Faith 
into a new place. I want to push you out of your box into a new place. Come on, engage in this moment. Don't observe it. Don't be quiet. Somebody go in. Somebody needs to tiptoe into it for the first time. As I was out in Colorado, we were at this, we were, we were like two hours outside of Denver on this mountain ridge. And all around us, the, the trees had been burnt down. There was a fire that had swept through this area in 2002 during fire season. And so I asked questions and I found out that the fire went around the ranch that we were staying at in 2002. And at the beginning of the season, the fire swept through. And later, towards the end of fire season, a second fire swept through that same region. And what they went on to, t to explain to me was that when the second fire swept through the area, it cleansed the soil so that new growth could come forth in the soil. Had the second fire not swept through, the soil would have never been cleansed. And I just feel like in this place today, God is God's fire, His Holy Spirit is sweeping through this place today. And there's gonna be fresh soil to produce new fruit, new fruit. And so I wanna speak to you in this place today. If you've, uh, and maybe you're up here right now, but I also wanna give an opportunity for response for those in this house that maybe you have never said yes to Jesus. Maybe you've never had the first touch. Can I tell you that today he's inviting you to take the step. I don't know where you're at in your seat, but he's here in this place, there's fresh fire. And so if you're up here and, you're, and you wanna make a commitment to Jesus for the first time, I need you to slide to the middle. If you're out here in the rest of the auditorium, this is your opportunity to say yes to him. Listen, he's saying, come on, come follow me. Come go on this amazing journey with me. The Bible says that, that any, anyone who is in Christ Jesus is a new creation. The old is gone and the new has come. And in Jesus' name, you no longer have to be condemned. You no, no longer have to feel like you gotta work your way towards God. He chooses you right where you're at. And he says, come follow me. So this invitation is for you. Make your way forward as the band uh, cries this out, as they sing this out. Come on, just sing this over them. If you need to respond to Jesus today, just go ahead and make your way forward right now. Oh, I want a fresh, fresh fire. Fresh, fresh fire. Oh, I want a fresh, fresh fire. Come on, somebody, if you believe it, that's all you gotta say. Hey, I want a fresh, fresh fire. Anybody up here responding? I just want to make sure that if, if anybody's responding today, that I can lead you in this prayer. I'm just gonna I'm gonna pray this out actually. Because of this ministry call. You might be in this place and this response is for you or maybe you're joining us online. Can we, can we all just agree in this prayer? Say, Jesus, I invite you inside to be my God, 
to be my savior and to be my friend. Forgive me of my sin. And today, I choose to trust in your finished work on that cross. Thank you, Jesus, for proving who you were when you rose from that grave. Fill me with your Holy Spirit and help me to walk all the days of my life devoted to you. In Jesus' name. Come on, can we give God some praise in this place? I'll make it easy for you. If you prayed that prayer, we got a team over here that wants to give you a Bible. Go see them, get your Bible, and receive some prayer today. Come on, church, can we give Jesus some praise in this place today? Come on. Thanks again for checking out this video. If you'd like to stay up to date with what's happening here at Love Church, hit the subscribe button or download the Love Church app, which is free on any app store. Have a great week as you continue to experience God's best for your life.